All right, we are recording and we are going to get started. <clears throat> all right, so we are talking all about H5P, right? You came to H5, please create an interactive elements in your courses. Um, so H5, please, is a way for us to say, number one, please use it because it's fantastic. But then also, too, it's a fantastic tool. And we're going to show you how it's fantastic to create interactivity in your online courses. So what are our goals for the workshop? First, it's just an introduction to the H5P technology. I want to be really, really clear in that this is not exhaustive because H5P is a lot. Um, and so we really want to just give you an exposure to what it is and give you the opportunity to see some things so that maybe you'll want to play around with other tools within H5P that maybe we show here today or that we do not. But it is a true introduction. So please keep that in mind as we go through. We're going to explore the four reasons why this technology follows online best practices, because we know following online best practices improves the quality of your online course. So anytime we can incorporate best practices, particularly within one tool, we can incorporate four of them, then that's a pretty fantastic feature and something that we want to try and um, integrate into our courses throughout campus. And then lastly, we are gonna do a demonstration of the capabilities in D2L and provide some practical examples for using it because it's really important to not only show the technology, but explain about how you can use it because otherwise it's just technology. So let's start with what it is. So in technical terms, H5P is HTML5, and I believe that stands for, and Karen or Scott, tell me if I'm wrong, Hypertext Multi-Use Language 5. I think that's what that means. Now I say it in those terms because I'm an instructional designer. I am not a technologist. I have to learn technology just like everyone else does, and sometimes it's a real struggle because I don't necessarily think it's one of my skill sets. But yet here I am coming to you, talking to you about it in a very short amount of time. And so I think it's important to learn what it means for regular people terms, no offense to Scott, our technologist, um, in regular people terms, because that doesn't mean much to me. So it's an interactive content creation tool that can be fully integrated into D2L or Pressbooks. Um, I just want to say a little mention about Pressbooks. This, this focus of this presentation is very much on D2L, um, just because it reaches a broader audience. But Pressbooks is a fantastic thing we have now at NTSU. It's an open educational resource which you can create books yourself or with other in collaboration with other faculty. And everything that I'm going to show you here is integratable with Pressbooks. So when you get that survey at the end of this presentation, when Sheila sends that out, please don't ignore it. If you want to hear about Pressbooks, fill out that survey and let us know. There's a comment box that says, hey, please do a workshop on Pressbooks and we will start working on that for you. Um, plus two, I would love to hear your feedback because I'm always looking to amp up my presentation skills. So anyway, if you'll fill out that survey, that'd be great. But we're not going to focus on Pressbooks. We're focusing on D2L. So again, what does that really mean? I love this little kid because he's very like looking at what he's looking at going, I don't get it. And sometimes we need a little bit more to get it. So here it is. You can easily create content fully embedded in D2L that follows the science of learning and engagement which is always an excellent practice, right? So I emphasize easily because oftentimes as a faculty person, because I also teach, I can be intimidated by technology because again, not a technologist. But what I'm getting ready to show you today and what I've done, I've been able to accomplish in about six and a half weeks. So I went from not knowing anything about H5P to bringing you this presentation six and a half weeks later. And so that's why I want to express to you how simple it really is to use. Is every tool as simple than the other tools? No, some are simpler than others, but there are a lot of fantastic tools that are really simple that you're going to be able to embed in your courses. And then also following the science of learning and engagement, we know that students who are engaged with course materials, engaged with their instructor, engaged with their peers, they're more likely to stay motivated, they're more likely to have a good course experience, they're more likely to be satisfied, and they're more likely to be successful. Now, I'm not going to go into depth about that in this particular workshop. All of that's very important, and I'm, I'm 
going to include and have included resources at the end of this presentation um, to give you some of that background of science and learning and engagement. Um, but that's not the focus because we really want to show you about the technology and the practical uses for it. Um, but those resources are at the end. And if you want a workshop about that, again, fill out that survey and let us know and we'll do one and get it ready for you. So now let's talk about the four reasons it's worth using. <clears throat> the first reason, I think I've said engagement 50 times already and I'm on slide four, um, but it increases engagement. So you can see in this photo, the woman here is engaged with whatever it is she's looking at on screen. I don't know if she's engaged positively or negatively at this point, but I just really care that she's engaged, right? She's really interested in whatever it is she's looking at. And we need to do our best as faculty and instructional designers to do everything we can to make our content engaging. When we're trying to follow that community of inquiry model that I, we have talked about in various workshops over the years, I guess now, um, we're always thinking about that peer-to-peer -peer engagement, that peer to, or the instructor student, but then also engaging with the content. And this is a great way for students to be able to actually engage with the content it's, and have some interactivity with it. So for example, if you have a Word document or PDF document with key terms, with definitions, that's great. Students may print it, students may look at it, students may ignore it. However, if you create dialogue cards where the students have to go through each dialogue card with the definition on one side and the word on the other, that makes it a little bit more interactive for the student because they're not just looking at a static piece of paper. So those are the kinds of things when I'm talking about increasing um, activity and engagement with course materials. And you'll see more of that when we get to the show and tell portion. Our second reason is it's FERPA secure. FERPA security is really, really important. We know it's important. They train us or test us on it all the time, right? Once a year. And so the issue has been in trying to find ways to make your courses a little more interactive, a little bit more fun, a little bit more creative. We often have gone to external apps to do that. And truthfully, that's just a big no-no because when it comes to external apps, those are all owned by private companies. And you don't know from one day to the, to the next what that company has decided about privacy settings, security concerns, terms and conditions, terms of use, and what may be purpose secure one day may not actually be purpose secure the next. So, and that's why there's no way to just have a list of apps that are always purpose secure because that always changes. By using H5P, you take all of that guesswork out and you know that you're doing everything you can as a faculty member to keep your students' information secure. And I think that's a really big deal. A third reason, it integrates with the grade book. I know this is gonna be maybe one of y'all's top reasons because it integrates with grade book. And it's a fantastic way to get assessments in the grade book, but I wanna take a minute to just talk a little bit about formative and summative assessments and using that within H5P. There is a quiz tool within H5P, but I do not think based on my experiences thus far, the other IDs may disagree, um, that our quiz tool in D2L should be um, used rather than the H5P quiz tool because we really want you to think about these activities and the things that you can do as formative assessments for students. Students oftentimes feel very stressed out because they don't have the freedom to fail. And if you give them opportunities and activities that allow them the freedom to fail, then oftentimes they have less stress when it comes to that actual punitive assessment um, that's summative at the end. And these activities are great ways for students to be able to engage in these things and, and having that fear of failure and it being okay. I also know sometimes we get concerned because if there's not a grade attached, then why is the student going to do it? And I know that that does apply to some students. It's always going to apply to some students. Just like if a student is really determined to cheat, they're always going to figure out a way to do so. But in the middle, there's a, there's a lot of in the middle there where there are a lot of students, if they are engaged and they are motivated and they want to learn, then they'll engage with these activities even if there isn't a grade attached. But there are things you can do to help students, to help push students, if you will, to make them required, meaning you can attach release conditions that say you must engage in this activity before you get to this next activity. You could create a long list of activities and say as a participation or attendance or something like that grade, you could say here's a list of 10 things throughout the course as long as you complete five of them. 
thinking about it in those terms in order to give students those areas to, to fail, because that's how we learn. We, we just, we're not perfect from the get-go. Well, we're not perfect ever, but we're certainly not perfect from the get-go. So giving us those opportunities to practice is a really big deal. And the last reason is accessible. I think from a faculty standpoint, for me, this is the biggest thing because accessibility can be tough to do, even though we, I believe we all want to do it, right? It's, it's really about following that quest for 2025 and that diversity, equity, and inclusion. This makes, H5P makes it inclusive because you as a faculty member have to do almost nothing to make it accessible. So what do I mean by almost nothing? If you use the audio feature in H5P, you still have to upload a transcript to go without audio. If you use images in H5P, you still have to provide alt text for those images. It's not going to intuitively know what the image is. And remember, you can get around that by checking the box that says markets descriptive, but, they, but then we're losing the accessibility and the inclusiveness. So don't do that, please. Um, but then think about what your um, descriptions are. Think about them being rich descriptions as if you could not see the image, what, how would you want someone to describe it to you if you couldn't see it? So think about it in those terms so that when students are using those assistive technologies, they are getting the same experience out of it um, as a student who doesn't need that assistive technology. Next and last, you'll still have to caption your videos. Aside from that, that's all you have to do to make things fully accessible using these tools because H5P has created the questions that have to be asked for assistive technology and answered them for you. So the one thing about using videos in H5P, if you have narrated, um, or I'm sorry, captioned your videos using YouTube, uh, you will have to include a VTT file with a YouTube file because H5P and YouTube are not compatible in that way. It is compatible with Panopto, and it is incredibly easy to make a VTT file as Karen and I discovered and Kim discovered when we were practicing. It's really simple, and it's really simple to include in H5P. So those are my four primary reasons why it's worth using. So I kind of want to stop here before we move on and actually get into the tools to see if anybody has any questions thus far, whether they've been in chat or if you just want to pop in and ask a question. Nothing so far. You're good. Okay. All right. So what can I create in H5P? So I'm just going to let this run for a second because I want you to see all the things you can create in H5P. There are a lot of things you can create in H5P. Um, it's almost done and it's finished. Okay. So there are 30 items at the, at the moment. There are 30 items that you can create in H5P. There are additional items in beta testing. I did not list those. But these are currently the 30 items that you can create. The things that are highlighted in white are the things that I have personally created, whether it was for something I was working on for development, if I was collaborating with a faculty member, those are the things that I've personally created. And that's why I wanted to stress to you that this really is an introductory workshop because I've done 15 of the 30 things. Um, because there's just so many things and all of it from my perspective as an idea is so cool, I'm going to get to everything eventually. But these are the 15 things I've done so far. I also tried to choose the things when I was learning about H5P that I thought faculty would find one, most useful for their students and two, easiest to create. I am a big believer in starting with the easy to create and moving to the hard instead of starting with the hard, right? Because I'd rather have one H5P item in my class that I knew how to create than none whatsoever because I was stuck on trying to make something difficult to begin with because it sounded cool because all of these are cool. Um, so, that's everything that you can create in H5P. So we're gonna have show and tell today because I don't, first off, don't wanna talk to you the whole time. Y'all don't wanna hear me. Um, but we actually wanna do a little show and tell to show you and tell you about some of these technologies. Uh, Cause you wanna be the cool kid who has the cool stuff in their online class, right? And you wanna make learning fun and engaging for your students. So today we're, I'm going to show you and walk you through developing an accordion some dialogue cards, and then question types. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna try to fit in as much as we can 
But these are the things that I thought best to start with to show you how to do because um, there are so many different ways that you could use them within your class. Now I'm gonna tell you about the column feature, the course presentation, drag the words and interactive videos. The only reason why I'm telling you about these, do I think they're as dynamic and awesome as what I'm gonna show? Absolutely. But they also are a little bit lengthier to create. And again, we're pressed for time. So I'm gonna tell you about those, but I'm gonna show you about the others. Does anybody have any questions before we get to show and tell? You're good. Okay. This is a list of resources that you will find in this presentation, just so you know that they're out there. Um, and of course, at the end of this, um, if you have additional questions about anything, you can always contact us at online at mtsu.edu. Or if you've worked with one of your IDs before, shoot us an email, whatever works for you. Um, but if you have questions, please reach out in that way once we get through show and tell. All right, so while I set up show and tell, talk some extra yourselves. Any questions, comments, concerns? All right, so the first thing I think y'all should do is get an H5P account. So how are you gonna do that? If you have a course in D2L that is really old, do not pick an active course, that would not be good. If you have a course that's really old, if you have a course development shell that's really old, if you have a sandbox that you like to play in, go into D2L now and get into that course. And then once you get in that course, because we are talking about HTML, which is are these descriptive boxes in D2L, like that's my extent of HTML, that's what I know, right? Not a technologist. So to start your account, to create your account for H5P, all you have to do is hit the insert stuff button in a, any dialog box. It could be an announcement, it can be news item, it could be any dialog box whatsoever. And scroll down to the very bottom where it says H5P, and click on H5P. And it should give you something that says about creating your account, starting your account. Scott, help me out here if I'm not right about that. Um, but that is literally all you have to do to create your account. And it's done. Just using that insert stuff button. Which should give you this, this is a single sign-on, this is the h5p.com site that MTSU uses. Um, you can access H5P either through here or you can access it through D2L either way. Both works, they communicate with each other, this is a single sign-on, um, but it's easiest to start your account in D2L. Um, the organization of H5P is just like any other folder organization. Um, so like you can see here, this is my folder, this is my stuff. I've got the workshop, we did something for new faculty, there's a CISC. So I've got a few things in here, so it's organized by folder. So think about when you're starting to create something, think about how you want to organize the information so it doesn't get lost. Um, I recommend either calling folders by their course names if you know you want to put things into specific courses. Um, and then within that course saying module one, two, or unit one, unit two, whatever it is that you call it. And that way you can easily keep it organized that way. Any questions about any of that? Okie dokie. So I'm gonna start with a tell because all I'm doing is telling you about it. So there is a first... question. I'm sorry to yes. interrupt too, Tara. Oh. There was a question and I'm wondering the same thing. Where okay. does this screen live? Like, how do you, after you start your um, account, as mm -hmm. you were just showing us, where does this come up? This comes up in the, literally at the h5p.com. So if you were to go out right now and go to, and Scott, tell me if I'm wrong, h5p.com, because you created your account in D2L, it should give you that single sign-on access directly there through our MTSU single sign-on. Is that correct, Scott? And that's where it lives? I just put the link to the, the actual site in the chat room. Thank you. Thanks. Of course. So here's where your H5P lives. Um, and I'm going to start, like I said, with the tell folder, because I just want to tell you about a couple things. 
that you can use. So the first one I'm gonna tell you about is a column. A column is just how it sounds. It is a way to list information vertically in a column style that you can embed almost any tool into the column. So for this column, there is text and I did an audio, which if you hit play, hopefully you will hear. Hey everyone. The focus of the second module in our course is the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, AKA FERPA and publisher integration. All right, so that's what a column sounds and looks like. And this is what it looks like in D2L. This is actually, this little guy is not part of the column. I made him, so please, that's not, don't use lightning. Right here is what I just played you embedded directly in D2L under the module two description. And when it comes to editing in H5P, you can edit directly in D2L, or you can go to that h5p.com and edit there. I find personally for me, I like to edit in the H5P site rather than editing in D2L, but that's just me personally. It truly doesn't matter which way you wanna do it, doesn't matter. Um, but that's what it looks like in here. So that's one of the tells, that's column. Another one of the tells is drag and drop. You literally can create drag and drop activities, right? That then you can check. So we're gonna go, well, we know, I just talked about external tools not being for the save. So these also do D2L, so we should be good. And I'm gonna check it and oops, I got blog wrong because blog actually isn't for the save because it announces to the whole campus. So please don't use it. Um, but you can then retry and do it again. So that's what a drag and drop looks like, which I think are really fun. But again, for the purposes of this workshop and time, that one takes a little bit longer to set up. But if that is something you want to see later, like I said, fill out that survey and let us know. A course presentation, you can set up a what I call a static course presentation so that um, there's no narration to it. This is a slide deck where you literally can go from one to the next and add questions at the end. This is why I wanted to show you individual questions rather than actually building a quiz because you can put individual questions within um, slide decks and the interactive videos and presentations. So I wanted to you to be able to see that. Um, and I got that right. So yay, I can keep going. Um, <clears throat> there's the next question. I'm not gonna answer all these for you, but it does give you a summary slide so you can see what a student did or didn't get wrong. And here's the thing too, I did not integrate this particular, integrate, integrate this um, with the grade book. I really want students to just engage with it. I don't actually wanna give them a grade for it, but it lets them know what their score is. And for those students who are competitive and competitive with themselves, that's enough because they would be like, well, I wanna get a perfect score. And then last tell is interactive video. Again, because it takes a little bit more time. Welcome to your module five now. I didn't want it to start. Um, let me turn the captionings off. This was captioned, by the way, using YouTube, so it's possible. And it's easy because not a technologist, but this is a just a little something to show you. Um, of course, I turned the sound on. This module, like many others, had two checklists. The first was focused on D2L engagement tools, and we talked about why it's important to upload your profile picture, ways to incorporate chat into your course, and best practices regarding announcements. So let's do our first little pause and see what you might remember about those particular tools. The reason why I wanted to show you this is it's an interactive tool that actually has another feature, which is the drag and drop text feature so that you can literally ask questions in the middle of a narrated presentation, whether they're true false questions, drag text questions, um, drag and drop questions, true false questions. You can embed all kinds of questions within a narrated um, presentation. And so that's why I wanted to show this to you. And you can put all kinds of rules and conditions on it. So for example, you cannot progress in this presentation until you fill out this particular knowledge check. And I have a few throughout this minute and a half video. So that's just the tell. Do you have any brief questions about the tell before I get to the show of the show? Kara, there was a question about uh the results of if you take the tests or if you answer the questions uh, that D2L will uh, score those and keep yes. that scores? 
Yes, if you, I'm going to show you how you would do that if you want to integrate to the gradebook. It's really as simple as checking a box. Um, so yes, it will keep those scores if that is something that you wish to do. Any other questions? All right, so, excuse me. So the first thing I'm going to show you is an accordion, and we're going to walk you through this. The reason why I'm, I'm using this first is I actually think an accordion is a fantastic way to introduce each module because you can collapse the information. It's chunked into bite-sized pieces, if you will. Um, and again, the student, although they are interacting only by clicking on things, it's still an interaction that they're having that amps it up from just reading the information. And they don't actually get taken to another screen, which I know is something that students sometimes don't like is, well, I don't click on it because I don't, I don't either don't care or it's just going to take me to something else and I just want to get going. Whereas here, they really do just look at the accordions in this way. So this is one of the three reasons or one of the things I think accordions are great to use. So to create an accordion, all you have to do is select the add content button. You will not get this because I'm in a share folder. It's just for me. And here it's going to pop up all the different types of tools you can use. I like to sort it from A to Z because that just works for my OCD nature. And the accordion is always first. This details button, if you want to click it, explains what it is in H5P and gives you a little content demo if you would like to um, watch it. I, I strongly encourage you to watch the tutorials that H5P provides for these tools. They're all really short. I think the longest one I looked at was maybe three minutes um, and they're extremely helpful. So um, I strongly encourage you to look at them. Once you see what the tool is, this accordion, you can either click use here or you can go back to, oops, cancel, I'm so sorry. Go back to the page that you're on here and just click it and it automatically creates the accordion. So you have to give it a title, you gotta call it something. So again, really think about where are you gonna put this in a course? Are you gonna include it as module introductions? Then maybe you wanna think about calling it module introductions and naming it for each module or a uh, module introduction to your PRST 399 class, something like that. So for my purposes, I'm calling it a test because I want to get rid of it later and I don't want to make sure I can find it. Um, and then it's asking you here is the content of the panels for the accordion. So what is the first thing that you want them to read? If it's an introduction, call it a module introduction. So you would title it you would put your text here. And as you can see, it's a dynamic box. You can do all kinds of things, change font sizes, colors. You can add links, bullets, numbers, et cetera. I'm just gonna top in a bunch of stuff because I want us to go to the next one. And to add an additional panel, that second panel, you literally just hit the add panel button and you say, okay, these are the module outcomes. I could type and you would put your text here and write little asterisks. I have to put something there. And then we're gonna add one more panel and call it our course objectives. And we're gonna put a little bit of information here. And then we're gonna go down to this part. This you actually don't want to change if you're creating accordions, leave it the default. Um, and then you have down here in the, under LTI settings, right here is where you talk about whether or not you wanna send a score to the LMS and again, you can do this with every single thing you create. So if you want to send a score, do you want their score to be on the first attempt, the last attempt, or their best attempt? That's the only thing you have to decide if you want to send a score. If you don't want it to be scored in the LMS, leave it with the default of do not send score. That's how it integrates in the gradebook. And it'll integrate the, in the gradebook, it'll say external learning tool. And so now we've just created an accordion. So you hit save. And now here's my accordion with my gobbledygook in it. And to embed that into D2L, I'm gonna go right here to this description box for this module. This is my sandbox I play around in. I'm gonna go to the description for this module. I'm gonna go back to that insert stuff button where you created your account. Go down where it says H5P and then you tell it which thing to insert. 
So I was under my show and here's my test and you hit the insert button and then hit insert again and update and voila, here is your module description you just created in H5P. Any questions about creating an accordion? Can you do things like add links or videos or things like that into the accordions as well? Yep, absolutely. <clears throat> Any other questions thus far? One um, more thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, if, if, you, if you insert a link that is specific to your D2L course, like a quiz to that course, do you have to update it? If I'm trying to figure out, I have like five sections every semester, usually three of one survey, two of another. So I try to limit how much I have to change. Sure. Across this. So and one of the things I always have to update is links to quizzes and discussions. So is, is there an easy way to do that without having to go individually and update the module, the update the accordion in H5P and then move it over and then go back and update the link and then move it. Do you see what I'm saying? I, I think I see what you're saying. I will say this. If you edit something in H5P, it automatically updates in D2L. You just have to refresh the page. So, and the same goes for H5P. If you, if you do the edit feature in D2L, it's automatically gonna update it in H5P. So I think as far as that goes, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you still have to, if I'm understanding your question correctly, you would still have to update those links um, for those particular options for your students if you're using them each semester. But as far as the editing portion of H5P, um, it would easily be changed in either location. And you can also, one of the great features about H5P is once you create something one time, you can go over here and hit those three little buttons and tell it to clone. And it's literally going to clone what you just created, whatever that is. Um, and you hit, the, you have to hit the clone button again because otherwise it doesn't, it saves over what you did. But now you can see where it says clone of test one, and I can move that clone to any folder I want to and rename it. So oftentimes I think it's really easy as functionality wise if you have something that you're making multiple items of to make the first one clone it over and then just make a couple of little small edits to you know, say, welcome to module two or, or whatever it happens to be that you're using the accordion for, but you could clone anything. Anything that you make, you could clone. I don't know how much that addressed your question. Scott may have additional input to add, if any, or the, any of the other instructional designers. Did that address your question at all? Kind of. Um... <laughs> I think I, I mean, the idea of cloning, so probably what I would do is I would make different folders for each section and then clone it into each folder and then update the class specific links on that. Yeah, I, I think that that would be fastest. And, and like I said, I'm, I prefer editing directly in this H5P screen. That's what works best for me, um, but you don't have to. And again, as I said, whatever you edit in here, when you save it and you refresh it in D2L, it, you don't have to do anything in D2L. You don't have to re-embed it. You don't have to do any of that kind of stuff. You just, um, it just automatically updates and refreshes for you. So that is a good thing for sure. Irina has her hand raised. Uh, what? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. sorry, I, uh, I didn't research that myself yet. Uh, how many nested levels for the accordion is allowed? As many as you want to add, but keep in mind cognitive overload, because if you add too many levels, you're still going to cognitively overload your students. You're just doing the overload in smaller amounts of overload. So I have not read about what best practice is. Uh, as far as number, I don't know that, that that's out there, but I'm going to say from, from an ID perspective, you don't want to do anything more than maybe three to four accordions, depending on the purpose of the accordion. If you are using the accordion, maybe there's a process that your students are learning and there are five steps in that process. Well, then I think a five-step accordion is a great way to explain that process in a very linear way for students to understand without overloading them. Um, so it really does kind of depend on what you're thinking about adding for the accordion, too. 
Any other questions thus far? Okay. So now I'm going to go on to, I'm going to do true false because it's so fast, right? Because I'm looking at the time going, geez, Louise, it's going. So true false, just like it said, uh, I didn't actually put text in this one. Oops. Um, <laughs> so if I check it, I'm going to be wrong regardless. But to create a um, true false question, it really is as easy as going back to that add content button and going down and finding the true false option. Down here, again, you can go to details and view that little video, or you can just click on it. And you have to give it a title. You always have to give it a title so that it, it uses it for searching purposes. I'm going to call this test true false. And we're going to say Nashville is the capital of T. Right, I spelled that right. All right, we know that that's true. So we are marking it as the correct answer. Here's the kind of fun stuff, I think, when you're thinking about the behavioral settings for what you want students to see and how you want your questions to ask, to um, show to them. So do you want there to be an enable retry button? Do you want students to be able to type a question or try a question and immediately be able to retry that question? Then enable the retry button. Show the solution. Do you want students to be able to see the solution? If it is a formative assessment, maybe you have them take it one or two times and want to show them the solution so that they understand what they're getting wrong or on the reverse, what they're getting right. Um, you can show the confirmation dialogue on check, confirmation dialogue on retry. What does that mean? That means it's gonna say, do you really want to retry your answer? Do you really wanna check your answers? And this is where you put in feedback about right and wrong answers. So you could say, correct, right? If they get the Nashville right. And if not, you can say, oops, not quite, try again. Now, these are really generic, like this is not gonna really help you if you're a student trying to get feedback. I'm just trying to be quick, but that's where you put your feedback information in. For text overrides and translations, I'm gonna be honest, leave this alone because this has to do with accessibility. And so unless you're literally trying to translate it into a different language, there really shouldn't be anything down here that you need to mess with with text overrides and translations. And then again, if you want to have this question count in the grade book, you would tell it which attempt, first, first, last, or best, to send that score to the grade book and then hit save. And now you have your true false question. And if I hit false, it says, Oop, try again. And I can retry. So that's a simple way to make true false questions. And those are questions that can be embedded, like I said, in those static course presentation dialogue decks or in interactive videos. Any questions about that? Okay, then I'm just gonna keep moving. Hey, I used Nashville as the capital of again. Didn't even mean to do that. Okay, so fill in the word. Uh, this is again, another question type that I think is great. Uh, I put type in parentheses because the little bit of feedback I have received about this question from, from people who have used this question type is, fill in the word can get a little confusing because you're actually gonna type in the word. So fill seemed like a little bit of a misnomer to them. Um, so type is something I put in in parentheses so students would know that that is what they're supposed to do, that there's not something they're actually going to fill. <clears throat> but that is fill in or type in the word type question. Um, and to create one of those, you would go to that fill in the blanks. And this is where I, where it says task description guide telling the user, this is where I say type in the missing word rather than fill, because for whatever reason, it just seems to be more straightforward. You have to give every question a title. So this is test three. And it's showing you right here, hey, I don't know how to do this. Do you want me to remind you how to do it? And say, sure. And it's going to tell you right there, this is how to create a fill in the blank question. You don't even have to watch a video for this one, which is awesome. 
Um, but how it works, um, we wanted to say Nashville is the capital of, in order to create that fill in the blank blank, you just type an asterisk before the word and after the word. And that's it. If you want to grade this, you can give score ranges and what it means by range is if you want to say 90 to 100%, you did awesome. Um, 80 to 89%, you did a great job. You know, 70 to 79%, mm, if you did pretty average, might try a little harder. You know, something along those lines, maybe not say try a little harder. But anyway, you get my gist that you can um, put individual feedback for each score range as well. And again, those behavioral settings, that's where you do the retry button, whether or not you want to see them, the solutions. Do you want to make this case sensitive? Um, I'm not a big fan of case sensitivity and fill in the blanks because that hurts students unnecessarily in my view, but that's me as a faculty person. It might be important to capitalize something. So that's where you would fill um, in this. If you wanna make sure that they have to answer all the fill in the blank questions before they can see the solution, this is where you want to check this. Um, and then you can do things like put input fields on literally put them on separate lines. I don't see the need for doing that unless you have a really long block of information um, and then accept minor spelling errors. Again, that's completely up to you whether or not you would wanna do that. Um, leave this part alone. And then going back to those LTI settings is where you would send a score whether or not you want it to go to the grade book. And so now we have created this fill in the words or type in the words. Does anybody have any questions about that? All right, so then we're gonna get to this last one, multiple choice. And so just like before, I'm not gonna go to the screen where it says find the multiple choice. I think y'all got it. So you would go to that screen to choose multiple choice. And here is where you're gonna type in your question. So the reasons listed below, why should H5P be used in its online courses? Here where it says media, you can also put in optional media in your question. You can put an image, you can put a video, you can totally do that. That's where, whenever you see media, that's telling you you have the option to put in media. Um, and that goes for many of the questions in H5P. So here's my question. So now of the available options, they always start you, I believe, with two. It may be three, but I think it's two. So my first option, well, it's fun. That's it. That's all I'm putting. So is that correct? No, it's true. Yes, but it's not correct. So here's where you would put in information if you want to give them a hint for this question. Here is where if they get the answer incorrect, while this is true, it's not one of the four primary reasons to use it, right? So if you pick this answer, this is the response you're gonna get. Here's my second option. It adds creativity. Again, true, but not necessarily the point. Again, you would put in your information in here. A message displayed if answer selected. You can also put in a message displayed if answer is not selected. Um, sometimes you wanna give information to students because they chose um, the wrong answer, but I prefer to give them information for whatever they respond to. So if the answer is wrong, I still put it in here where it says check if this answer is selected. This is what they're gonna get so they know it's wrong. To me, this is confusing if it's not selected. That seems odd to me, but Scott might have a different idea. He's played in this probably as much or more than I have. It increases engagement. This is one of the options. This one is actually correct. So this is where you'd wanna check the correct box. And here I said, yes, this is what it's gonna display if they correct this answer. Yes, it's one of the primary four reasons, it's blah, 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 right? And then one more, it stops students from cheating on quizzes. We know that's not true because no tool is ever cheat proof. If you want to continue adding options, all you have to do is hit the add option button and you can add multiple options in addition to the two or three that it automatically provides for you. Again, you can add a score range in here from however you want. And to add a range, you really do click the range. If you say, okay, from zero to 59, you might wanna say something like, please contact me for a meeting. 
um, to discuss your performance because that's really bad. Uh, so that is literally what you can put in if they get these defined score ranges um, and you can put in any increments that you want. So you want to do 60 to 75, you want to do, you know, by quarter, whatever it is you want to do, it will let you do that. And you can also distribute evenly. I'm going to take that out. Under the behavioral settings, that retry and show solution button, select the look and behavior of the question. This really is what it looks like when people, or when people, when students click on it, it doesn't have anything to do with the question choices or answers, that kind of thing. It's just, how do you want it to look? Do you want it to be check boxes? Do you want it to be radio buttons? That's really it. Um, you can give a whole point or give one point for the whole task, meaning if you want to um, give a full point for each multiple choice question, great, give a full point for the whole task. You can randomize your answers. You can require answers before solutions can be viewed because you can always take off the social show solution button. Um, you can have a pass percentage. You can show score points. You don't have to show score points. There's all kinds of things that you can do within H5E and pedagogical decisions that you're going to make as a faculty member as to what you think is best for your students as far as the information that you're trying to get across to them and to help them learn. Um, again, you have this text overrides and information. If you ever want to see what it looks like, I mean, please feel free to go down there and look at it. But again, this is why I love H5P because, well, I wouldn't know what to do any for any of this and it's already filled out for you. You also have options for um, finished text as far as are you sure you want to be finished? Do you want your confirm button label to say finished? Do you want it to say something different? You can change these, but again, I'm a firm believer of don't mess with something that has to do with accessibility ever if I don't have to because it already works and I don't want to break it and I'm not a technologist. And then going back to that LTI settings where again, if you want to score something, you tell it the score and it's going to connect it to the grade book. Any questions about multiple choice? So now you can see this multiple choice question is here. I'm going to say it increases engagement, and it's going to say yes, it does, because it's one of the four primary reasons. Um, so that's multiple choice. So we literally have about 10 minutes left, and I know I ran through a lot and, and probably cognitively overloaded you, but there's so much to see, and it's so exciting. I wanted to show you those things. I do have dialogue cards also, but I think it's more important to address any questions that y'all might have. Um, so what ones might be out there, if any? I feel Sarah, like the chat's have, been going crazy. Yes, uh, <laughs> I, I have a question about uh, the multiple choice when it's used as a multi-select. So if, uh -huh. if you have uh, two correct answers and uh, the student answered one, uh, so will it give it 50% or uh, do we have any kind of, um, you, you know, say on this matter? Uh, well, a couple of things. You, in order to do a, a multi-select question, it is a, it's the same as a multiple choice. You just tell it that multiple things are correct. Um, and that's where it goes back to, let me go back down to here, those behavioral settings. Do you want to give one point for the whole task, meaning they have to get everything correct? Do you want to give one point for um, or each correct answer, et cetera? When it says single answer mode, Scott would have to speak to that a little bit more because I've not had the ability to play around with that yet. Um, but that is where you would tell it, like I said, whether or not you want it to count and then whether or not you want to give one point for multiple correct answers or not. If you do not give it, if you don't check this box and there's multiple correct answers and it's automatically going to give each, each uh, correct answer a point. So say you had a multiple select question, you had five options, three of them were correct. If you do not check this box, and three of them were correct, and they got the three, then it's going to say they got three out of five. If you do check this box, it's just going to give them a point for the whole question. Does that help, Arena? Uh, yeah, not, comp not not into the entirety, but it, I understood that it's uh, it's equally um, equally weighting all of the correct answers. So yes, it is equally weighting all of the correct answers. It means that they cannot do the different weight for the different correct answers. Correct. That is not an option to my knowledge at this time. Scott may have a different answer since he's been playing in it longer. 
It's not an option currently, but it is something I've suggested to them multiple times. So we'll see what happens. Thanks, Scott. What other questions might we have? There's a question in chat about just kind of showing, okay, so now that you've created it in H5P, what does it look like in the grades area or in a D2L module? Can you reshow that? Absolutely. So y'all are getting a little sneaky peek of the synchronous instruction standards that I was talking about that's full of H5P. There is only one assessment in this course, which you're gonna get a sneak peek of. <laughs> um, right here, it's the final knowledge check. And it's actually, I embedded this final knowledge check as a web page within D2L. Um, and so to do that, right, you, I created the web page just like you would in D2L, and you're going to go back. <clears throat> let's do this. You would go back, and that same insert stuff button that we use to create the account is how you insert your items from H5P into these dynamic boxes. So again, whether it's a description box, it's a, you've added a web file, it's in a checklist, it's in a discussion, it's in the quiz tool, it's in an announcement, any place where there is a box that looks like this, you can put in H5P by going down to that H5P and selecting what you want to insert and then inserting it. And so when you see this in the course, of course, as the student, you're not going to see this edit in reports. Um, this is what you see as a faculty person. But here are the questions for that particular quiz that you can scroll through and take. I don't want to show you too many because oh, y'all aren't supposed to see that <laughs> unless you take the course. <laughs> but that is what it looks like within um, D2L. There's also some other fun things that we just didn't have time um, to show you because we just don't have the time. But I mean, we this is something I used accordions for because we were talking about two different things and we want to go, this is this, this is this, what's the difference? I think that's a great way to show information through an accordion. Um, so that is what it looks like within D2L. I also made this, by the way, within H5P under the course presentation. I decided I, we wanted to have descriptions for every submodule that looked a little different. So we created that. But that's what I mean by originally everything connected to the gradebook. So like there was a grade attached to this. And I was like, oh boy, there's a lot of fixing after the fact. So I'm glad that we changed that default. What other questions? And just to confirm, when you are when you did select something to insert into D2L and have it integrate into the gradebook, what does that look like? Oh, I'm so sorry. In the gradebook, I forgot you asked me that. So I just showed you the, the only item that's graded in this particular course. And there it is right there. It's an external learning tool. It's worth 40 points in this. I call it the CISC final assessment. So it looks just like any other thing. The association is just the external learning tool. And it will automatically grade and send it there because that's what we need. We need to save time as faculty where we can. What other questions? We only have a couple minutes left and I can hang on and stay a little bit longer as needed. Um, but any any additional questions? I know our time's about to expire. So you created um, test questions in this. I mean, is it better then to have exams there as opposed to in the quiz area in D2L? No, I don't think that is my personal opinion. No, I don't think it is better. It is as good as maybe, and remember too, because you're in the quiz, you can actually embed the HP five questions in the quiz as well in the quiz tool, because it's one of those HTML boxes. So you can use those features within the quiz, but I still think using the actual quiz tool within D2L is the smarter choice comparatively. Um, and also for those of you who remain, um, Nate Callender did a, presentation on quizzes last week that was about the best presentation I've ever seen about quizzes, period, including the ones that D2L produces. So I strongly encourage you if you use quizzes to go out there and check that out, um, particularly because he uses dynamic um, quizzes and calculations and all kinds of fancy stuff. And we, and can, have a link for, we can have a link for that workshop, right? Because I couldn't find any, to be honest, but I wasn't poking too much. 
Uh, yes, um, it'll be, I know there's a link to that workshop and this workshop will also be posted on our MTSU online YouTube channel. So I strongly encourage you to go out there and subscribe to it. Um, and we will also send the presentation to, um, to the attendees as well. So you have those resources that were at the end. Any other questions as we finish up here? Well, if there are no other questions, then I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and tell you all I really appreciate y'all coming. Please stay a little bit longer if you have the time and you wanna ask more questions, I'm happy to do it. Thank you. No problem. Thanks for coming. I can hang out if you have a little bit more time, we can answer some more questions. I am gonna return the recording off.